Right, welcome back, UK Pro Muscle Podcast. And today we have a very, very special guest. Um, the man needs no introduction at all, but I will introduce him anyway, Dr. Scott Stevenson. Um, arguably one of the greatest minds there is um, in the world of bodybuilding, especially when it comes to the scientific background that Scott has and the ability to really dig into the research and the intricate details of the game. So I am very, very excited to get this series going. Um, I actually wanted to do um, 10, a series of 10, but Scott actually came up with 12. Um, <laughs> but again, Scott is definitely someone that many of us look up to and many of us reach out to get the, get the answers, get the answers for the many topics that, that we may all be looking, um, looking to get answered. So yes, Scott, let's do a little introduction. Uh, tell us a little bit about yourself for the listeners that don't know you. Uh, I'm sure that, you know, it will be hard to find them, but for those that, that, that do not know you, um, let's, let's talk a little bit about yourself and tell us what you're all about. It's funny. Someone was asking me, um, oh, someone who had no idea what I, what I, like nothing. It was literally kind of cold call. Doesn't know me from social media, knows nothing. So I was kind of like having to introduce blank slate. And one of the things I'll say sometimes, I have to say it slow so they'll get it, is that I'm a purveyor of bodybuilding brain candy. And I use brain candy intentionally because it's not, it's like, when it fits this topic too, like, a lot of this is really simple eat train sleep recover like repeat you know there are details that matter you know to some degree and so those details are what people like to hear me ramble on about and it's kind of like brain candy it's like you're eating like just sugary sweets it's not really you know brain doesn't need those things you know to function you don't need to have donuts or you know name your favorite candy or whatever it's brain candy but it sure does taste good and it's kind of cool and it's fun. So this is kind of brain candy, but I tried to make it all substantial. So I think if we, if we do what we planned on, we can kind of go through these. You wanted to kind of a top 10 factors to uh, maximize off season gains. And I kind of came up with, well, there are two that are sort of like the, the, the same side of, the, of one coin. And then I added one in that makes sense. So it kind of came up with a dirty dozen of do's and don'ts, mainly do's and kind of one don't that um we can run through so as a, as a soup like this is sort of generalized stuff but when we if we pick one if we do this will be very unique if we make all the way through all 12 and don't get sidetracked that would be probably a first because i almost we always always, always go on a tangents so <laughs> I, I'm I think definitely what, expecting, listen i am already expecting a tangent but i think any of you that actually listen to scott's podcast um on this is bodybuilding Every single time I listen to them, it's, you know, we talk about one thing and then dive right into it and then it just kind of falls on from there. So, yeah, yeah I love this. But what, one thing as well I've noticed with yourself, Scott, is you can, you've got the ability to truly explain things so, so well that anybody can understand it. And I think that is a special skill that I believe someone that truly understands everything to the detail has the ability to do because there's a lot of people, educators out there, that we'll use a lot of big words and try and make <laughs> things as complicated as possible. With yourself, what I found is actually the opposite. You can make something really complicated and really, really, really hard sound so easy and so easy to understand as well, which I think is going to bring incredible value to our listeners and people that are obviously going to tune in to get the secrets. You're, you're not i'm glad you think that not everyone thinks that to be honest sometimes i get the like you need an encyclopedia to understand what this guy's talking about things and oh, cool. every once in a while i have some people balk but um that's the idea you know like if you know something really well then you can explain it to a kindergartner as they say and yeah. you know unless you're you know diving deep into like philosophical notions or like you know quantum mechanics and that kind of stuff then a lot of this really is pretty basic you know so um, yeah, I'm glad you think that. Yeah. So should we like bang through the 12 and then cover them, start covering them? Or you want to like sort of move at a moderate pace? Let, let's list out all the 12 and then what we okay. can cover, what we can cover, we'll cover. And then, you know, I'm, right. I'm probably expecting this to be a bit of a series if I'm totally honest with you, because if, if we go through the 12, I don't think that, I think that's going to be a podcast that's going to last 
a substantial amount of time. So, you know, yeah. let's, uh, let, let's go for the 12 and then let, let's cover, you know, what we can do and then, uh, yeah, make it, make it a little bit of a series in my opinion. Okay. So let's see Did I come up with, uh, I think I may have come up with 11. Let's see if no one may be able to count. Um, so number one, so we're talking about dirty dozen do's and don'ts or 10 factors, 10 or 11 or 12, something like that. Yeah. I had to sort of artificially separate them into categories because they're all interwoven, of course. Yeah. You know, um, it's kind of like, you know, walking, you have to breathe while you're walking. So it's not like you're breathing and then you're walking back and forth. They happen at the same time. So first one, and I'm going to, of course, I'm going to be focused on training. People know that that's kind of the funnest part of this for me is progressive overload. So, and the second one, I'll just throw it out is sleep recovery, mainly recovery, sleep being a primary, the primary way that really happens. That's so undervalued, not so much anymore, but in, it can be, uh, it has been until people really kind of picked up on important importance of that. So sleep recovery, including sleep, everything related to your health, um, massage, liver health, everything else that's involved with recovery. And here's the thing, those two are basically one and, and, and the same to some degree. So you can have, and I'll explain what I mean there. If we take, and here's where the analogies will come in, hopefully kind of make a sense. You can have someone like Jordan, who we both know, Jordan Peters, who lives and dies by the logbook and obviously has made himself into one of the, you know, the largest, most muscular human beings ever to walk the face of the planet. And he has to manage his training load with his recovery. He's a master at that. Everyone who's followed him sees how he does this. And he's figured out his own sort of solution for that. So he creates a stimulus and then he recovers from it that allows him to, to go into the gym and have a greater stimulus and, and train, get an extra rep, get a PR on an exercise, whatever it may be. So he can't do that latter thing going into the gym and doing that if he, unless he's recovered. And so he knows, you know, when to try to do those things, when to train in a certain way to try to set a PR, when to come back to the exercise, when to do a deload and various things we'll get into talking about. And then you have at the other end in terms of training, what, you know, some people will say, well, you know, Ronnie never used a, a, a training log and Arnold never used a training log or what have you. And the thing is, is that they were managing all these things. They were recovering, obviously. And, you know, if Ronnie trained, you know, let's say at his prime when he's pulling eight plates off the floor um, with the weights that he used in his first six months of training, he wouldn't have been the Ronnie that we know is, you know, the greatest of all time. So, and, and, and think about the guys, for instance, another example that's more modern day is over in oxygen, at Oxygen Gym. We had Brandy Curry on the podcast. So it really is kind of cool to talk to him and get the, um, the scoop. Inside on how things, what's that? You got all the inside info. Not, not all of it. We just, we did, but some of the stuff that was interesting to me. And one of the things he said, and this is, I think, a really important piece because <clears throat> you want to, there's this just natural inclination to look at what the biggest and the best guys do and try to do what they did. And one of the things he said, and he talked about, you know, himself being there and, you know, Ruli and all the guys who've been over there, many, many of the biggest names that come through, Rami way back when, what have you, is there are guys that come in who are really, really good bodybuilders, but not absolute top tier yeah. um, necessarily. And they pay a lot, I think. I think it's, you know, it's not, um, unless you're maybe, I don't know how, what his circumstances are, but it's not a free ride. You just can't walk in and like, hey, just join in with, you know, the, these top trainers and train, but they run everyone through the ringer. They just, they just annihilate them and create a massive training stimulus that can only work if you can recover from that. So those guys doing all those sets, taking so close to failure repeatedly, they're guys that fall to the wayside all the time. You may see them in a video if you go and say, like, what happened to that guy? Like, he was amazing. Like, yeah. he was ready for, like, well, he, he just wasn't able to hang with that particular training regime because you have to have genetics to recover from that in order to weather that training stimulus and the more you can stimulate the more you can grow yeah. but that only matters if you can recover from it so you can go in and and intuitively and not even consciously be thinking about you know what's my 
my perceived uh, um, recovery, I have a perceived recovery scale I use with clients, you know, and grading those things subjectively, <clears throat> which is very helpful. If you've got great genetics, you just know when to pull back. There's like the classic story that I mean, I've read and heard that, you know, there was a day or this would happen every once in a while with, with Franco and Arnold. And they go into the gym and like, there's some days just like, ah, eh, we're not doing it today. Let's just go to the beach. And they just knew that it was the time to take the day off. And they just entrained instinctively that way. So the other half of progressing and getting better, and I'm going from the, the generalized notion that the research substantiates to some degree and practical experience does, is that if you keep on getting stronger with the same reps, more reps with the same load or both, ideally, you're going to get bigger. It's going to happen in your physique. That's, that's what we see in the gym in terms of driving the, the, the growth with what you're doing in the gym where form is following function. So the form being the muscle mass that you have follows what you force the muscle to do, so to speak. But you can only, the backside of that, that's the horse. The cart has to come along for the ride. The recovery has to be there. And the horse has to get fed and recover and that, that has to happen on the other side. So someone who's not log booking still is, is going to see over time improvements in what they can do in the gym. Yeah. And, and it could be just, you know, something where, you know, I'm still using the same weights, but if you looked at them, you know, if you had video, you could make a comparison five years previous to that. They were, they were inclined pressing or flat pressing 405 for 10 reps or, you know, 200 kilos or 180 kilos for 10 reps. Um, but back then they were like bouncing off their chest and barely getting it because they want to get a set of 10. And now they've got an extra 20 pounds of stage weight or more in the off season. And now the control is different. The mind muscle connection is different. That's a performance in, in improvement right there. So the function, their ability to handle that weight and direct the force to the muscles they are trying to train with the exercises. There is a performance enhancement. Yeah. It may not pan out or be easy, easily seen in those numbers that you're because they're not they're not writing any numbers down. They're just kind of winging it, yeah. but they're becoming a, more of a badass in the gym along the way, and they're becoming a better a better uh, uh, bodybuilder along the way too. So those are kind of the two sides of progressive overload, and you could be in between. You know, you could be someone who you know logs just like one one approach I've used with clients and that I used years ago was you've got like meat and potato and exercise and it's in fortitude training in my training regime. Those are the ones you log book, you go in, you like, you give yourself a, even, even a, a, a tester exercise, like pick your top 10 or 12. What can I pull from the floor, you know, for a roughly a set of 10, I want to bring that from 315 to 405 to 495 to 585, et cetera. Uh, and you know that, what can I, you know, weighted shins, incline presses, dips, squats etc cetera, etc cetera. and as long as those are moving in the right direction you know everything else can be added in too but you know you're going the right way if all of a sudden like you know okay for, for the last three months i felt like dog shit i don't feel good in the gym i'm not moving moving things well and i'm keep going back to my squats and my squats are stuck or they're go, or they're revert, reversing in terms of performance then that tells you something's, something's uh, awry. So that's sort of an in-between way that could be managed in a multitude of ways, logging just some exercises every rarely, or, you know, like Jordan at one end of the extreme where everything is meticulous down to the rep and the form and the tempo, et cetera. Yeah. So those are the top, top two. <laughs> top two ticks off. I love that. Yeah, I love that kind stuff. Of I love that. The top one and slash two. Yeah. Um, and I'll just sort of start moving. So there's, uh, and these are, this is kind of two as well, but so that's kind of, that points to this idea of a dose response that we're putting out in terms of um, what you're doing in the gym, driving the growth that you have. So that's a function of volume and effort. So how much you do, like everyone's some of this volume is the driver of muscle growth. Well, you can do 20 sets, you know, where you're, you're training like a Girl Scout, as you might say in the States, and it's not going to take don't you mention, nowhere. Scott, just don't mention reps, reps in reserve. Just do not mention reps in reserve. Well, I, I, well, I, I think I've seen a couple of your podcasts, I think, and like, I, like you guys want to unfold, like, yeah. People are going to get upset. People are going to get upset immediately. <laughs> 
the devil's in the dose and the, you know, and the, the, that's, we'll call it potency. How about that? Yeah. Right. Like if you, if someone says, um, let's say you've got aspirin and then you've got some, you know, brand spanking new non anti-inflammatory that you can take one milligram of, you know, it's really, really potent and it works as well as like five standard aspirins. That's like that all out badass potent set. We're not going to use those, those, those disallowed, those banned words on your podcast, but managing that is, is the thing that has to come into play, I think. And I prefer an auto regulatory way of doing that. Um, so, you know, if you're someone who likes to go in and train like Jordan and like you, you know, and like me, where I like to just like take, go to the dark side, you know, and dance with the devil as often as possible you can't do 20 sets of that yeah i, I think pe people like to call it the dark place but the way i like to look at it that, that's not a dark place for me that's a happy place for me yeah yeah a dark place for me would be a session where i'm not able to go 100 percent. right so i yeah. think people have got a bit of different misconception because for me being able to take it there that brings a lot of happiness yeah i get it too yeah you, you know when you know yeah yeah. yeah, I think that that's definitely a big misconception. Like you, you had a lot of people uh, basically say you're not supposed to go to failure all the time because mentally it doesn't do you any good. It's like, well, it depends for who. Right. You know, for me, it, it actually gives, you know, it makes me happy, makes me better because mm -hmm. I'm much happier throughout my days knowing that, you know, I've got that hour or an hour and a half in the gym where I can, you know, go in. I'm much happier any other time and I'm much happier in the gym doing so. So I think... That's definitely one one big thing that people often overlook. It's a it's a blessing to be able to do that. Absolutely. You know, when you're injured, it's like ah, this sucks. Yeah, you know, <laughs> it's really not fun. Yeah. Uh, and it's you know, like an analogy popped in my head too. Sometimes I read, you know, some people's like, I'll try anything, but I'm not jumping out of a plane. Yeah. You know, you know, with a parachute or without a parachute, and because that that's like the craziest, silliest, stupidest thing. Why would you ever do that? But some people, they used to have the, um, the World Free Fall Convention in my hometown in Illinois, where literally everyone would come together. They'd set the record for the most people all in one configuration. And these guys were just crazy. They, there was, they came, went to the mall once. I remember I'm walking through the mall as a kid, and there's these, and there, this is no way this could happen now. These guys would have been arrested in national news. They're all in camo with like goggles on, and they've got, they've got machine gun squirt guns. And they're making military noise, like, hut, 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 hut. like they're in some sort of, uh, you know, some, they're doing something. They're doing military roles and they're shooting people with the squirt guns. You know, this is like 30, you know, 40 years ago. Wow. And these were just guys who are in town, just raising cane, jumping out of airplanes repeatedly. All day. That was a blast for them. Whereas that would be a nightmare for some people. So, you know, those sets that you and I and Jordan and many of the listeners, I'm sure, like, those are the greatest things ever. That's a blast. So. But 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 that has still has to be auto regulated. You can't get away with just you know banging away. It would be great if you could, but you have to do that. So that's that's the to some degree that's that has to be, um, and it, that's an important part of this. And it's kind of the most important part. So you get kind of sciency with this. Um, there's I think of this, and there was some research that unfortunately was was falsified. It been it had to be retracted. But you still see this, yeah, in some of the, yeah, there was some, some Barbalo is the, was the first author of these studies out of Brazil. And yeah, they, the, there's a graduate student, it's all in the literature. I'm not like, you know, I'm not gossiping. This has actually been, been borne out um, that, and that's kind of aside, but you still see this pattern in the literature. You see it with um, all sorts of stresses uh, that there is a hormesis relationship such that a small amount of stress creates a small amount of adaptation more stress more adaptation eventually you get to some optimal and then once you go beyond that you start having lesser adaptation because you're you're not if you're repeatedly providing the stress you're not fully recovering from that eventually at some point and there's some there's some uh, pictures of this actually some graphs i use in my talks there's one on my instagram at least once or twice eventually you get to the point where the you're barely coming back and recovering. And this is where I think sometimes some bodybuilders can be. 
um, and it's especially difficult to manage this when you're trying to push your limits, is you came back into the gym and you've just recovered. You haven't like you haven't recovered enough to make progress. Yeah, which goes I've, back been, to, I've been there many times. I've been there many times. Yeah, so you're kind of just repeating what you're doing in the gym. You're hanging in there. You've got so much. It's a double-edged sword. Your mental capacity to drive and push, and you're of course you're enjoying the very nature of what you're doing, is such that you'll push through anything. And it's an interesting thing. Here's kind of a practical um, thought that. I figured out over the years personally is when you start doing shows and you have to go like, you know, if you're just an off season body builder, it's a whole different deal than trying to like keep your loads and your reps the same as you, you know, go in through a prep and you really get lean and things get really tough. Then you develop this mental fortitude that when you come off, like, you know, for the off season, everything's so easy. And now you've adjusted your psychological scale for how hard training could be. So you start, you have an ability to push harder than is optimal for you. You're too far towards you. You're shaking your head. I, you done this. I must have spent 12 months once literally just beating myself into the ground. Yeah. Because I was so used to feeling like shit. Yeah. Like feeling less shit was actually feeling good. Mm-hmm. And yeah. it was just a vicious circle as I'd walk in the gym. I'd, I'd feel just better and I would bury myself. Mm-hmm. I'd walk in the gym again, I'd try and repeat that, and it would be a continuous circle of that. And yeah, when you're so used to going hard and knowing you can push the boundaries and knowing you can push through feeling like shit, mm-hmm. it's so easy to get in that rut. But once you get out of it and once you start recognizing, right, this is how I'm supposed to feel to feel good, now right. I can progress, now I can actually keep up with the stimulus and be able to recover from it that is when you kind of find the right sweet spot to mm-hmm. be able to push forward but i think the biggest the biggest issue that i have had in past from experience and i see that with a lot of clients and people is you get so used to feeling battered when you're feeling totally battered then you recognize it but you even when you're coming back up you're still battered you're not ready to kind of push mm-hmm. again but because you're, because you're feeling slightly better in your head, you're like, I'm ready to go. Yeah. You've yeah. shifted your scale. Yeah. You know? so bad because you just end up making just, you know, suboptimal progress. The suboptimal progress is just not what it's nowhere near what you're capable of actually doing with progress. Yeah. I have, um, I have this perceived recovery scale linked on my, it's in my book, my video and bodybuilding coach book. It's on my site. I'll send you the link and you can maybe put it in the show notes somewhere um it's it's got it's got verbal anchors you know it's a basically it's just a zero to ten scale but i have my clients use that every time they check in to kind of see where they're at it's a it's a nice shorthand form instead of them trying to like write some verbal description it's a very generalized thing you could break that down and look at like you know how the muscles feel how you feel psychologically sometimes you can be really sore and like you know pretty bright upstairs so you know someone who notices that difference Um, you know, that's one thing I have to watch out for. I'll be okay in my head, but the muscle soreness will still be there. Um, I tend to be really, really sore. And so there's some variation there, but it's that having that verbal scale like that, that to to let you say, okay, you know, I'm honest with myself. I wake up in the morning. I've not got myself into the mindset switch that I'm going to have when I go in the gym. So I do this before I'm, I'm start my my, that mindset you're talking about where you've kind of adjusted everything and you're ready to, you're ready to go to war. It doesn't matter if you're bleeding out, you're going to go in there and train like an animal. It's going to happen. That's not the best time to judge your recovery status because it doesn't matter. You're on the verge of death and you're still ready to go. <laughs> Do you know what, Scott? Fully enough for me, generally, it's my cognitive function that really slows down when I know that I'm, I'm overreaching. Mm. Mm-hmm. It's... The most productive times of the day are like between half past, between 5 a.m. up until around 11, 12. Uh-huh. So if I know anywhere in between that time, my brain isn't on fire or not as efficient as I normally am, right. that's when I know I'm, 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 you know I'm getting to a point where I probably need to pull back. Yep. Absolutely. Well, that's- 
And that's why I think of this as auto regulation. It's yeah. like so many aspects to what's how you feel. Yeah. Like you, it's funny you mentioned time of day because circadian rhythm. There's there's actually questionnaires you can take. You know, just have you maybe done this to see like kind of where your what your chronotype is. Um, so some people are night owls, some people are you know morning birds. Yeah, I, and, I think I was a night owl, but that was just down to having a shit routine. Okay, uh, yeah. Yeah, you know, you know what it's like, especially in off season. But right. ever since I've been able to truly like nail down my routine, it's my ideal time is like between half past eight, nine p.m. bedtime, and wait time around half past four, five a.m. every day. Right. But that is when I actually feel like really good. Yeah. Any other times, and I start seeing a dip. But with that as well, when I start seeing the cognitive function slow down, immediately then sessions are starting to become a struggle as well. Mm -hmm. So it, it kind of correlates together because generally I just push past it, but now I'm able to pinpoint these little points. That's when I know, right, you know, it's time to do a deload. It's time to pull back. So I'm able to progress. Whereas beforehand, when I wasn't so in tune with my routine and how, how I'm actually functioning, it'd be so easy to dismiss that because I just think, oh, I'm just having a bad day. I'll go again, mm -hmm. I'll go again, I'll go again. And that bad right. day turns into weeks and months of just total yeah. crash. Yes. So, yeah, that's, there's, so you, you touched on deload and that's, and periodization is, was one of the, made the list. But that, this is where, you know, there's some subtleties that make sense. So like, like one thing I didn't put in there is train at the time of day that your training can be best. Some people don't have any choice in that matter. Yeah. Um, one thing that popped into my head, an old strategy that that from DC training, one of Dante Trudell's um, notions was if you go in, it's just like the Arnold Franco thing. You're training the basic two way split in DC training. You train three times a week and you and every set that counts or the working sets are do or die. That's how, how it runs. And he would say, you, do, you, were, you know, six, eight, ten weeks in and you just have a kind of a bet like you need to take a day off. You just take one day off. But, but what that does, it gives you a massive break. So let's say it's a Friday, which would be a typical time because you just trained Monday and Wednesday. You take Friday off. Now you trained, you know, Wednesday was, let's say, legs. And you're going to come back and train upper body, not on Friday, not on Saturday, Sunday, but on Monday. And, you, and legs goes then to the next Wednesday. And just that one day sets you back two or three days, depending on upper or lower. And that would could refresh you for another three or four weeks. So you don't have to take a full deload. You can just take a mini break. Um, what I've done in fortitude training, I have different volume tiers. And it's nice because some people like, you know, more is better bodybuilding mindsets. Like, well, I'm not going to take a day off. I can still train. I got to do something. Um, so I've got it set up. And like, this is like part, yeah, Greg, this is the part. And you're going to feel like, well, if I just, if I didn't do all my sets, then I wussed out, you know, I didn't do the, It's like, no, the smart thing to do here is recognize that your recovery abilities are impaired, but you can still create a stimulus. You can still pro prolong this blast if you're making good progress. And instead of doing the highest volume tier, part of the program is to auto-regulate on a day, daily basis your volume. I keep kind of the, the, the we're not going to use, the, use those uh, band terms, but the potency kind of the same. So the sets you do are hard. Just the effort, the effort, yeah. Yes, the effort, right. So you don't go and, you know, if you normally do 10 sets, you say, I'm going to do six sets. But all those sets, I'm going to set a PR on like four out of those six, you know, what have you. But I'm not going to, like the rest of the stuff is not recoverable. It's junk volume in that, in that particular circumstance, in that context. So that's something that can be done. So you don't have to take a full, you know, full break. Um, but you can bring things down and that may launch your, your recovery for it. So where you can carry on for quite a while beyond that. Not, so not all, all sets, blends together. Not all sets are created, created equal. Not all sets Abs are created equal. Absolutely. Yeah. That you need the t-shirt, man. Like that's, Do you know, you what? know? I'm going to write that down. I'm going to write that down. That's actually a really, I would wear that shirt. Yeah. Yeah. Quote yourself on that. So yeah. actually the next one in my list is, is, is periodization and deloads. So knowing that's part of the gig, you know, is it just that it kind of has to happen. And here's, I mean, it, so all these ideas, a lot of these are pretty much, they're all in my fortitude training um, 
uh, program. And it's funny, one of my favorite stories, you may have heard me say this before. It's from a guy that was one of the earliest people that I, that I trained and coached with fortitude training. He was a Brit actually. <clears throat> you probably, you may even like, he was on a lot of the message, message boards. He was really well known. I'm not sure that board is not even in existence anymore, but he was a pretty, I think he was a moderator. So he's a pretty well known, known guy, not a great bodybuilder, but just very prolific poster, really great guy. He's a, he was actually a, a maths teacher, a math, mathematics teacher. Really? And the, yeah. And the, so the, so the thing I, he had never really done was have deloads. Yeah. And those are built into the program. And I did them intentionally like a, like what would, would be done in sports with a taper. Yeah. So you bring the volume down, you spread out the frequencies. So you're less frequent, but you keep the effort, what you're doing high during that period. And then you have a period at the end where you take, you, you do nothing. It's kind of like an active recovery, yeah. but you take off like one third of that period. The nice thing about it is the way I generally structure it is it's the, the D load is one third of the time you've spent progressing. So if you go for three weeks, it'd be about one week. If you go for six weeks, it would be about two weeks. So you don't like taking a deload is if you follow that ratio, you don't lose anything or gain anything by, by training for a shorter period of time progressing or, or longer. It's still six and six, three and one is the same as six and two, it, it, nothing lost. So you don't feel like you're going, getting behind if you do, do that. Do you know what, Scott? I, I, this is what I love about deloads because for me, it's still an opportunity to progress, but on a small yeah. scale. So for me, mentally, it's much easier to go in the gym right now, still be able to progress in on a lesser scale than just sit at home and do nothing. Yeah. It's just so much more productive. And mentally, you know, I've been able to really tune in with that. And somewhat, I recover better because I'm still able to train and stay happier. Does that make sense? Sure. Absolutely. Yeah, it, it's, it's a funny one because obviously in the years that I've been training, I've trialed every method under the sun, as we do. Yeah. And that has definitely been the one that has resonated with me most. And it's the one that actually Jordan uses as well. It's me and him always talk about. It. It's like, we used to be scared of deloading. We used to be scared of taking rest. But the way we look at it now is it's still an opportunity to go in the gym and make progress, but on a lesser scale. So. Right. The biggest issue of always taking a deload was to take a step back and not be able to progress. Mm -hmm. So right now, Up it's here. just the way we look at it. It's like, I'm still in the gym. I'm still making progress, but on a smaller scale. And mentally right. and physically, that just gives me such a, such a bigger boost. Mm -hmm. So Yeah. Anyway. Yeah. But before I, I let you carry on as well. Yes. Scott's book as well. We're going to do a bit of a shameless plug now. And then we'll do uh, it again. Okay. But right. Scott's book is definitely a special one. Uh, be your own bodybuilding coach. I will put the links in the description in every episode that we do. Um, but it's something that I feel like any bodybuilder, any coach should always, always own. I think we've got two hard copies at the gym. Ah, uh, cool. You know, I'm yet to get the online version as well that I'm going to keep on a Mac, but I am going to get that. Because actually, um, you spoke about this with Scott McNally and Scott was like, it's much easier to have the the, the, the ebook version. Mm. Uh, because you can just bring a lot of a lot of data up on your computer and refer back to it. So I'm right. I, I basically I'm going to have a hard copy and online one. So I, you know I'm going to be the first one to put out there. But any guys, honestly, yeah. it's 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 amazing. And you actually cover the peak week in there as well in a lot of detail too. So yeah. it's 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 certainly something that's invaluable. Um, but yeah, I'll let you carry on now, Scott. <laughs> yeah. So so what, what what Jordan does and what you do is you you bring the volume down during your deed loads. Yeah. Yeah. That's exactly what I do. The, the story about the math teacher was I don't, he'd never really had a D load before. He had never really done much of anything. Yeah. And, and he was an animal. Scott, it's horrible. It's horrible. Yeah. <laughs> but when he did it, and this is what the funny part was, I remember him telling me, I was just, he was a very articulate guy. I remember it was so funny the way his laugh was, such a, it was like a, it was explaining a really good joke. And he goes in, comes back and he's, you know, and we pushed the food really hard. He made great progress. He comes in and, um, first couple of days you're doing loading sets. So heavy stuff, six to 12 rep range. And he looks at his log book and he's like, he doesn't really know what to expect. So he's like thinking, okay, so I got 10 reps with that. I'm going to stick with that weight, you know, and let's see if I can get 12, maybe 13. So then I'll progress. So I get outside my rep range and he gets like 19 reps, 21 reps with the load he was expecting to get 12 with. He's like, he's like, okay, well, that was, that was fucking awesome. What happened then, there? Yeah. Like, so, but 
but he keeps on doing that. Like he goes in the first days and he, he's like, he's like, he starts getting a little ashamed of himself because he, he teaches mathematics and he's like, did I misload these bars? Like, I can't even count the weights, you know, or like, I can't, what's going on here? I, I'm so far off. This can't be that I've actually improved this much and launched myself that. forward this much. I yeah. He was just, he, he was so dubious of the progress that came from that deload because he just didn't think it could possibly happen that way. But that happened to me. And I had this well, when I was a kid, literally when I was in high school playing football and, and I had, you know, I did everything. Like when they said, like, I just crazy. I, we had one program that was a hundred sets full body three times a week, you know, that wow. I did. I was the only one who did it. It was stupid wow. that they described that, but I did it, you know, and they were like a minute's rest in between set of eight to failure, seven of seven, eight to failure, and then something less than that. So it was like all those to failure. So that kind of asinine stuff. And I was doing that anyway, we got it. We were playing, we we're in the season. I got a uh, hit in the thigh. I got a thigh bruise. And I got sick at the same time. So I went from like all in starting school playing to I was laid up for like five days, just lying there, hardly eating. I felt awful. I got a really bad flu, came back in and I was just doing the off season weight training program. Same thing happened. I went in and they just kind of had like a tier structure to keep it simple. Either you use 135 or 175 or two of whatever. And I went and I went from like sets of eight to sets of 28. It was like asinine. It yeah. was bizarre. And it was just because I just rested. I would, I'd driven myself so much into the ground. So that is something that's really, really undervalued. I think if you can get that right, figure out your own strategy, which you Scott, and Jordan, and it's, Scott, it's amazing. I can't even tell you how long I have wasted spinning wheels just down to being greedy and not resting enough and not taking deloads. <laughs> Yeah, I can't even tell you like the amount of time I've wasted. It's it's almost like an addiction. Like you can't help yourself in a way. Mm -hmm. but once mentally start coming up with strategies to actually help that, like you just know how productive that is and how much progress you make on the back of the deload. So the biggest thing that that people always need to remember is if you're not going back in the gym after your deload and making a substantial amount of progress, you are not fully recovered enough. Right. And that is the biggest mistake I used to make. I used to think, right, I've had a couple of days off or, you know, I've had a mini deal of a couple of sessions and I'd be like, I, I feel a little bit better. I'm going to go back in. And right. it's just the same story. I'd have like probably one good session, maybe hit a couple of PBs and then yeah. just back to square one. So yeah, yeah definitely a great point, mate. You, you made that. Like the progress after a deal of should be substantial always. Yeah. Yes. I mean, especially off season, if you're, if yeah. you're dieting down, yeah. like, you know, not necessarily, but off yeah. season for sure. And it's like, sometimes a rule of thumb, if you've never done this before, if you don't realize what the gains will be is like, wait until you're just absolutely chomping at the bit. Like literally you're having to be chained at home or you want to go to the gym yes. and then wait another day or two. Yeah. Yeah. And okay. then, then you go in there and talk about psychologically, you're just like, I can't wait. Dude, I'm going to make gravity my bitch today. It's going down. Yes. And then, and then it takes off. That, so you got to. That's literally always the feedback that I'm always looking from clients. It's like, unless I hear them saying, or they, they literally tap out the message and say, I'm dying to get back to my full volume. Like, right. you're not going back to it, you know? And, and that yeah. could take even six to eight sessions, you know? But yeah. With yourself, you know, honestly, Scott, there's just so many, you know, this is such a great topic because I can relate to it so much. And yeah, I think many bet. of the listeners will be able to relate to it so much. It's, mm -hmm. it's so undervalued and it can, it can literally cost you so much progress just through battering yourself to the ground, you know? Yeah. You know, and we could, like, this is a whole, like you said, it's a giant topic, but the way I, I did this intentionally based on the research, but also based on what happens with bodybuilding is I set those intensive cruises up. <clears throat> so that you end them let's say it's two weeks you might train like monday wednesday friday and mo maybe monday or something like that or may maybe monday wednesday sunday and tuesday something like that and then you have several days where you just have to fill the days with things that you wouldn't otherwise do you might plan a vacation with your family you might you know you know just a little day trip out you know for like hiking around those sorts of things that you don't do that you neglect when you're grinding over time. 
right? Yeah. Honestly, honestly. Yeah. You, you, basically, you basically describe it, me. You know what okay. I mean? <laughs> yes. Yeah. I mean, I've done it too. So it's, you know, it's oh, not the pot yeah. calling the kettle black in any way. Yeah. Um, and, but when, when you do like, so you do that and then like that sets you into a better place for, you know, diving back into the grind, you know, and it, and it restores your relationships. Yeah. I remember, I remember years ago um, talking with a guy who ended up at one of the Arizona state shows that I did. And I remember um, like, he was just like, he was talking about literally he won the whole show. He looked phenomenal, looked, looked badass. And that day, the show, it was just finally, it was kind of like the end was coming, you know, and he knew he was going to win and it looked great. And all he could talk about was all the relationships that he had damaged during the course of, you know, it was really bad. He's like, I can't wait to do this. And I got to re reconnect with my, my family and my friends and all this sort of thing. And, you know, he was fairly lighthearted about it, sort of joking, but he realized um you know what body the negative consequences that bodybuilding had on like you know a lot of things in his case so that it almost forces you to to do that and put that into your into your lifestyle to some degree which i think is just it's really good for mental it's really good in so many ways like that's a whole other it's a big tangent i think it's important for finding balance um, yeah, I, I agree i agree scott 100 mentally what it does is it almost makes you miss the gym so much yeah so it's both physical and mental aspects. When you're going back into the gym, you literally cannot wait. So obviously I'm competing in two weeks time at Arnold UK. And my fiance, she's actually competing two weeks after at Budapest. Ooh. So Ooh. yeah, she, she's been the fit parade uh, in fear class pro show. Uh -huh. um, so we've actually planned to stay, stay for a few more days after the show because I know with how I am, if we don't do that then, off the back mm -hmm. of her show, I, we just won't do it. Right. So we're definitely going to plan on doing a few days off whilst we're there. We're probably going to get a couple of sessions in, but then before we actually come back to UK, we're just going to, you know, relax and, and take some days off. Yeah. Not obviously not. We're not. We're not going to eat a lot of garbage because that's not what we do. But you, you, you feel awful when you do that anyway. Like you yeah, don't want to make. We hate it. We, we've got we've yeah. got a nice we've got a nice house you know booked and all that. So right just meal prep. But there's just, there's just so many nice places that we're going to be able to visit that we mm. wouldn't normally. And you know what? Right. Mentally, that's going to give us such a great boost to go into the off season. Yep. Just having that quality time, which I think people dismiss a lot. Mm -hmm. which, is a, which is a massive huge point you just mentioned you know i think i always say this as well the way your mind goes your body will follow yep and if your mind isn't refreshed as your body is it's just not going to happen in my opinion yeah and the thing that if you're if literally let's say you you didn't give a, a rat's butt about you know, balance or any of that kind of stuff. You just want to be the, become the best bodybuilder you possibly could. Yeah. It still makes sense to do that because oh, yeah. that's just the matter. That's the fact of the matter is that you're better at bodybuilding when you found whatever your semblance of balance is, you know, an argument that can be had and can run for hours is, you know, like extreme measures are required for extreme results or however you like to phrase it. And that's true. But I think everyone's got their sort of balance point, you know, and you know, like you're a better bodybuilder. You take, I mean, Ronnie Coleman, you know, genetics aside, obviously he could do things that no one else, you know, may mm -hmm. ever be able to do, you know, but he would take a couple months off after the Olympia and just do nothing, you know, because he knew he needed that, you know, to refresh himself, recover. John Meadows, rest in peace. John would do the same. He would lose weight after shows. Yeah. Yeah. Cause he's not a big eater. Like, and I would like talk to him like it's a month later. He hasn't trained. He hasn't got back to gym because he's given himself the needed break. And he's like, Scott, I'm down to, you know, it was when he's competing open. Like he might be 220 on stage. Like Scott, I'm down to 213, <laughs> you know, and yeah. he still looks great. You know, if, if, and he's not like, it's not like there's no like eating disorder, or, you know, a body dysmorphia in place causing that. He just gets busy with stuff. And that was evidenced in, you know, the fact that he was not, was the big eater when he stopped competing. He just, you know, so that was, that was his way of taking time off. So some really good bodybuilders, you know, underdogs like John, who made the most of his genetics and best genetics in the world, having that time off is super important in some way, shape or form. So, yeah, we're getting through the list, man. We're on, that was, that was number four. Yeah. I love um, this. I love this, Scott. Honestly, it's like, yeah, 
Like all these points are just so valuable now. Uh, yeah, thanks. This is um, this was fun to put together. I I was kind of funny. I'm like, ah, oh, this could take a while, and it literally just, I just I think I wrote the list in like you know eight minutes or something. Well, um, this is exactly why I thought of you to do this, mate, because I knew I knew it was going to be very much on point. <laughs> yeah, it's it was fun, and a lot of this this is actually some of this I've done. Um, it's nice we did it this way for my Muscle Minds podcast on the Think Big Network that you, you mentioned before, Scott McNally's network. It was a hundred, hundred. I, I, I actually listen to it every day. I've, I've oh, got shit. a lot of catching up. Yeah, I've got a lot of catching up to do. Uh, there we go. Look, I, I've yep. just clicked on that. That's on the first page. So it's cool. a great podcast. I, I'm going to have to give you a, a bit of a shout out on it because I, I actually listen to it on a daily basis. I'm not going to lie. It's fun to do. Like, like the L carnitine thing that you know came up, that was just we went off on that for like 40 minutes. I think that was un, totally unplanned. Yeah, I, I watched that straight away. And you know what? I dropped L carnitine. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right, right. I'm going to do another for people who are interested in that. They can find the podcast, they might listen to it. But I'm going to do um, a full write up paper on that and probably put it on John's site, put an abbreviated oh, version on my Instagram to get the basic ideas across, probably talk about it on the podcast because it's important information. You know, um, not that there people should be just like changing their preps and how they've done things. If it works, you know, keep doing it. But it's worth knowing. I've since heard from some people. The basic idea, this is a total, total tangent, is that L-carnitine seems to have it actually does have a direct effect on the actions of thyroid yeah. on your on your metabolic rate. And so I've like heard from one person who was taking pretty large doses of thyroid when using large amounts of L-carnitine, he never could really realize why he needed so much thyroid. And this finally like, oh shit, now I know. Yeah. So I'm gonna put that out because that's a thing that I've known about for a while, but it, I think it plays a more important role than I had, um, than I had suspected. So, okay, so number on, number five. Um, before, before we get into number five, yeah. L-carnitine, would you use it or would you not? Um, I, I've used it before. And, and I would, but just knowing there's, there's different ways that you can use this. So you can be strategic with this. This is where, you know, the drug use stuff can be a little bit tricky. Yeah. So one the way in which L-carnitine, uh, just if we're going to go off on the stand, the way in which L-carnitine is working is it's, it's increasing the amount of L-carnitine acyltransferase, which is the rate limiting enzyme for bringing fatty acids that are you're using as fuel into the mitochondria where you're burning them to produce energy. So it's shifting your fuel use towards fat use, which is what you want during exercise, at rest, et cetera, et cetera. From what I'm finding, and I'm still digging in to get like all the nitty gritty details, but you can load, you're only gonna store maybe 20 grams of that in a loading state, something like that is what I found. And so once you've done that, it's very similar to creatine. Once you're kind of loaded, You've got more creatine in the cells. Once you're loaded with carnitine, you've got more carnitine. You've got that enzymatic advantage for fat burning. Then you're good to go. You want to maintain that. Um, so taking more is basically just um, getting in the way with what thyroid would be doing to keep your metabolic rate up, which is going to mean more, more caloric expenditure, more fat loss, more fat oxidation. So using it, you need to use it smartly. More is not better here. More could actually... Um, blunt your the action of your thyroid and thus people would start using more thyroid which is isn't the problem you're not getting the other problem is that you've got carnitine because you're taking it in in massive doses or using you know twice a day injectable l-carnitine and it's sort of like um, another analogy it's kind of like you got a full tank you, your l-carnitine tank is full keeping the uh you know the gas uh running into the, your tank is just spilling it all over the place yeah. it's going nowhere not only that but it's also preventing the action of thyroid. So all that gas means that the thyroid, literally, if the thyroid needs to get to your vehicle to work, it's not coming anywhere near there because you've got gas all over the place. Literally, the L-carnitine is blocking the action of the thyroid. It's not getting to the nucleus where it, where it changes the transcriptions of genes related to metabolic rate. So, yeah, using it makes sense. Get loaded, just like with creatine. Creatine's different than maybe some anabolic actions to creatine just in and of itself. Um, but, you know, if you're taking 40 grams of creatine a day, you're way beyond loaded. You've loaded, you know, in a matter of, you literally load like 40, 60 grams. And I know people who've done like high amounts 
and claim there's an anabolic effect just from the create. And there's some, that's an interesting trajectory too. There's some interesting literature because I, I did create and research for my thesis and my PhD. So I knew so much about creatine back in the day. It was, it was ridiculous as it was supposed to be. But um, as far as I know, there's no, there's no advantage to loading with L-carnitine in, in after the being loaded and just piling in more and more L-carnitine. But there's a known and distinct disadvantage. Um, like just some of the data that I, I found so far, like a preliminary search to get some quantitative numbers, someone doing like two or four grams of oral L-carnitine a day. These are people who have Graves disease. So they get hyperthyroidism. Their metabolic rate is sky high. Their heart rate's high. Um, they've got that panic feeling that, you know, maybe some listeners know from too much um, thyroid. Yeah. Like you can't sleep. Everything, your chest is going to, heart's going to bound out of your chest. Thyroid clan and your hymn band all at once. Yeah. yeah like, like that, you know, but someone who's got Graves disease, like they're not using those other things, but they still, it's still that sense. You can, you can resolve those symptoms and bring metabolic rate down by like 50% just with two or four, four grams of L-carnitine a day in the course of several weeks. Wow. That's how powerful it is. So you wow. can take a hyperthyroid condition and treat it with normal average. You don't gotta, people aren't, you know, eating it like breakfast cereal. <laughs> They're taking in normal average oral doses. If we assume like 20% bioavailability, that's not a whole, that's like 400 milligrams, you know, 800 milligrams injectable assuming all of that's bioavailable it's going right into your bloodstream that's enough to substantially impair thyroid so yeah and and that's what that's what i'm going to you know uh, dig into in more detail on this in this paper and you know whatever i put out on we we'll talk about on the podcast and instagram so but lesser amounts you know let you know if you if you take in l-carnitine and it depends on how you do it how you know what the how long it's in your system you can keep those L-carnitine levels loaded with, with smaller amounts um, and not have this impact on your thyroid activity or the action of the thyroid on the cells. And there's another twist to this too, which is really interesting. I'm still digging into some stuff, but uh, you can see in at least in, in one particular case study that I found of a, a grave sufferer with hyperthyroidism, I think it was two, two grams. I can't remember exactly in this study, but same, same, you know, ballpark dosage of L-carnitine resolved their symptoms like almost completely, but there was nothing seen in essentially in thyroid levels in the blood work, TSH levels in the blood work. So, and this, this was like a two month study. So mm -hmm. it wasn't showing up in the blood work. So someone who's, let's say taking L-carnitine and they're, then they're trying to figure out like, I'm not like it worked for a while, but it's not working anymore. And there's going to be some variability here trying to use blood work as a guide is not necessarily going to be the best way, which a lot of times it is, but the thyroid and thyroid metabolism is very, very complex. Wow. So the blood work's not going to give you the, a, a good picture of what's going on in terms of the action of thyroid on the cells from what I'm finding. And I'm going to, I want to dig into, I have some guesses, but I want to dig into why that may be the case if, if it's even known any, at this point. Any application in off season? You know, it's funny because John used to say, John used to say the same thing, stay loaded, like, like creatine, stay loaded, you know, but don't impair your metabolic rate. Um, you know, I mean, drugs are kind of the icing on the cake, but, you know, let's say, I don't know, if you have someone who's got a runaway metabolism, yeah, you know, maybe, and, and they can't get enough food in because I've, you know, I've, I've, you know, heard from people had clients, maybe you have two, it's like, You'll have one guy who's, you know, growing on three and a half thousand calories a day yeah. and he's, you know, a hundred kilos or whatever. We've got another guy who's, you know, 20 kilos lighter and he's putting down five and a half thousand calories a day and yeah. he can't grow because yeah. he's active during, he's like Corin is a great example. Everyone probably knows of. just constantly moving. So she's burning calories, you know, from her knee during the day. So if you have someone, for instance, who wants, you know, a very sort of subtle, um, it's, uh, I don't know if you call it non-pharmacological necessary because you're not going to find, L you're not going to go out and like, you know, like dig up L-carnitine in massive amounts. It has, to, it's produced as a supplement artificially, yeah. but it's a very simple thing that could be used to bring someone's metabolic rate down, you know, who can't seem to gain weight. So, 
Um, and it would also have, you know, this is sort of theoretical. I haven't tried this out with someone had a situation. It's not something it could potentially be a way to do that. And, but still um, have an advantage in terms of fat oxidation because the L-carnitine does that with fat oxidation. So it's, 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 it's a way to bring your metabolic rate down, but keep your fat burning capabilities up kind of at the same time. So you're not completely shooting yourself in the foot if your metabolic rate goes down because L-carnitine has that positive impact on fat oxidation. So for a hard gainer who's maxed out his or her GI, that's one of the things on the list um, here is, you know, sometimes like if you can't eat more, you can't make gains, right? So you got to take care of your GI. So someone who's really pushed the limits there, that would be one thing that pops into my mind. Um, but I wouldn't do that. Like, so people are going to maybe hear this and go, well, shit, you know, I'm going to just take a bunch of L-carnitine you don't have to eat as much. Don't so do like, that. You know, don't do that. No, that's, that's not what we're getting at because food, because there's the energy value of the food, which is needed, but also there's the hormonal aspects of eating. So insulin, you know, actually for, for natural guys, for sure, testosterone levels are impacted by food, especially if you're comparing like dieting or low saturated fat diets versus off season food. So the food IGF one levels are impacted. Um, I want to look at IGF-1. Yeah, IGF-1 is reflective of nu nutrition status, you know, in a, in a strong way. So that's like one of its, 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 you know, as a clinical marker, it's relevant to, of course, uh, people who have acromegaly or low GH output, but it's also, you know, relevant to nutritional status and general um, protein balance. So you get someone, for instance, a burn victim, you know, and that's a really, really catabolic state. You remember... Um, metrics with scott Connolly. yeah yeah so like a lot of he used to reference and he did some work in this area i think too um burn victims yeah. right because it's a really catabolic state so they will do like iv amino acid infusions to try to reverse some of that because they're just their body is is so catabolic from the the injury from the burn and that was sort of the basis that he used to formulate metrics supposedly that was the idea of the line of thinking so IGF-1 is, is, goes just plummets in people that are burn victims. So if you decide, well, you know, I'm going to just create a caloric balance that's more positive by knocking out my thyroid with L-carnitine, um, you know, also you're going to probably knock out your IGF-1 to some degree because you won't be eating as much. You want to eat the food, you know, for the energy value as well as the hormonal thing. So no, a, lot of, a lot of brain candy there. Yeah, but... Yeah, I wouldn't you know do what, that. Though, do you know what, though? It's very, very understandable brain candy. So, you know, it, it, it's that, yeah. this is what we want. This is what we want. <laughs> yeah, right, right. So that's that's an aside. That's the, not even related so much directly to this, but it's, it's all connected, of course. Yeah. So let's see. Ah, so number five. Number five. <laughs> trying to get there. So these are like, I'm pulling from basic principles of training that should, can be applied to, you know, pretty much any type of even skill acquisition or sport and kind of two of them can be pulled together those principles being variety and specificity in terms of exercise selection so um variety in training means not just using the same exercises all the time um there's one one particular study there's another one didn't show this but one study showed they looked at quad growth in a training regime where they had limited exercise selection. This is Frontera, if people want to look it up, is the first name. And the other one they did, a, ro rotated sort of through a bunch of exercises. And they got quad growth in all the heads of the quad, I believe, um, when they rotated through all the exercises versus when they didn't and they had a limited number of exercises, they got quad significant quad growth in only one or two. So you, you're going to get, this is what Charles Glass is, you know, sort of renowned for. He pits all those angles and those exercises that are very specific and unique to try to, to get development where someone who's pretty advanced doesn't have it yet because they don't have a good mind muscle connection. He finds an exercise that basically doesn't allow them to not use the muscle he's trying to target for growth if they carry out the exercise. Dante Trudell would call, I'm talking about Charles Glass and Dante Trudell in the same, same sense, kind of funny, but Dante called it getting funky with it. Yeah. So, you know, you pick these exercises that put you at a very disadvantageous um, position biomechanically or lengthen the muscle where it's not normally lengthened um, and train it through that range of motion so that you can't use your, your shoulder or your forearms 
or what have you to move the weight. It only goes to the muscle you're, you're looking at. So you're trying to, trying to make grow. So finding those exercises, training with some variety um, is important for getting, you know, complete development in, especially like the back is a, a prime example. Um, but on the other hand, specificity of training makes sense too. So obviously like in a very, ob the obvious sense is like pull downs are not going to do much for your chest. You need to do exercises that are specific for the muscle. <laughs> so like that's the, you know, the big one. Some, sometimes like this probably aren't your listeners and some people have no idea. So some people are like, they're, I, I call them, and this is, I'm, this is meant to be derogatory. It's sort of funny. I call them motor morons. Like literally their motor centers don't even recognize what they're doing. They have like, they're just moronically like they're doing knee extensions. They can't tell what, what's being, what's being worked. It's like, it's right there. The muscles moving. You can't feel it. It's right there. <laughs> like it's, but some people like don't aren't connected in that way. Like a lot of personal trainers are thinking, Oh my gosh, yeah, I need to use that term because it's a common phenomenon. Yeah. So there's obviously that level of specificity, but also um, uh, to the individual, what exercise works really well for you? And you got to figure that out for yourself. So, you know, some people like to do, I was, I trained, um, got into training a little bit with Derek Oslin, lives here in town, a 212 competitor. Yeah. Um, and, you know, he's a crazy strong presser and he does, he does behind the, he does overhead presses, but in front. Yeah. That's part of why he has such a good upper chest. You look at Derek, like his, one of his best poses is a, is a front lat spread and his chest looks amazing in that, you know, it looks really good. So and cool. he does. So cool. Yeah. Right. You, you know, this, you know, this shot, like, it's like, ah, shit. It's, Let's hopefully they don't hope make us hold that one very long. Cause I don't want to stand next to him in that shot. Mate, it, it's a shelf. It's literally like, <laughs> yeah, He's, he did that. Like this last year, the side chest with the, with the, uh, you know, the can or whatever he did that with his like a shaker bottle. That's cool. do that. That's cool. I'm not quite there yet, but it'll come. <laughs> yeah. Right. Right. But, but he does that exercise because his shoulders don't work well for him. So this is the other part. Find the exercise that works specific to you. They're, 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 they're ones that work with your body that don't cause you uh, chronic injury types of issues. So, you know, prime example is like you got to squat for your legs and like if people are squatting like it took you 10 years to figure out that just hurts your back and your legs don't grow from it it's, you know don't do that like that's not specific to your biomechanics there's some really cool articles actually looking at um the q angle at the hips and fever link and those sorts of things literally in, in cadavers and you can just see the bones and there's substantial variability across humans absolutely you know, yeah I think the biggest issue I see with that is you've got the bench, then lift and squat. Right. And you, you know, the common thinking is you've got to bench, you've got to deadlift, you've got to squat. Mm -hmm. And the fact of the matter is some people are just not built to squat. Not, not, right. not the standard way anyway. You would have yeah. to modify that squat to suit them. It's yes. the same with bench. Some people yep. are just not made to bench to touch the chest. And again, what happened, what's the most common thing with benching? Pectors. Yeah. So, you know, I, I think that's definitely something a lot of people need to hear. Like, there is no set rules when it comes to training, and there is no set movements that you have to do. You have to, you have to tailor it down to generally what I always say is what feels best for you? What are you safe with? And what can you progress the most while staying safe? Yeah, like rolled into this, this one on the list is that mind muscle connection. Oh, yeah. You know, what, what you can actually feel and use. Um, I've been like I'm buffering, I'm trying to build up my German language abilities better. So I've been listening and watching, like I've been kind of like forcing myself to do as much in German as I can. So I've been watching some of Marcus Rule's videos. Oh, yes. Yeah. And he, like, those are fucking awesome to watch. I watched him in English and now I'm watching, you know, his, he does voiceovers sometimes for some of his old stuff. Oh, if you awesome. remember how he pressed, you remember his pressing. Yeah. Oh, in, unbelievable. Uh, but really wide yeah. way, like, like, like all the way out like that. Yeah. yeah wide. I've never seen anyone go. You couldn't go any wider. I tried that. I tried that once. It didn't really work that well. <laughs> yeah. Not for you, but Marcus's chest, you know, he got some tears in there at the end, oh, probably because he was able to, to blast his chest so well which made it grow as well as it did. Did you see the video in the supermarket where it's literally thicker than someone's width? Yes. Oh, yeah. That's one That's of my favorite, favorite ones. Do you know what? When I was like 15, I used to watch that before the gym like every day. And yes. I was 
oh my god i just want to be like him and there was like yeah. a whole video of him just like sat down smoking a cigarette and just spitting everywhere i was like oh yeah on the parking lot afterwards yeah yeah and his oh. his wife at the time i mean she was gigantic and he oh, makes her look small wow yeah yeah she's oh. big yeah so but like that was an that's an example he the way he did um bicep curls too you know was his own way yeah. you know um and of course you know marcus good genetics obviously so you I mean you have to be careful like another important thing that could have been and made this list is you know follow the paths of the people that are walking in the paths that, that you need to travel so you can't train like brandon curry or ronnie coleman like because you don't have their genetics you'd have known if you could long ago right people need to listen to this because that's the worst thing i always see is when people look at people that are genuinely smart like yourself because you don't have the muscle they're going to be like well what's he know? look at him and and i'm just right. going to do i'm not going to do what scott does i'm going to do what brandon curry does and i, can I don't look like scott do right or, or I'm not going to do what Scott does. I'll do what Dexter Jackson does. And let me tell you now, you're going to look like a swimmer if you do what Dexter Jackson does compared, yeah. to, compared to trying to copy Scott. So that's definitely something that, that many people need to uh, be mindful of is you need to look at someone who is a hard gainer that's got there, not someone that, you know, doesn't really have that much application or effort in the gym mm -hmm. and is already up there. Like They're going to be up there regardless of what they do. Yes. Those, I mean, those people, people with genetics like that, I have a whole talk. Actually, I'll, I'll even, um, hopefully we're going to get this together. I got a buddy opening a gym the weekend of the Olympia in Orlando. Oh, that'd be amazing. Um, yeah. And I think the talk he wants to have me do there kind of part of the opening is why you don't look like a pro. Oh, and, uh, yeah, yeah. You it's, film it's, it. it's all you need to film it. You need to film it. I, I actually have it on, I need to, I got a, a video that I've got to like, it wasn't captured as well as it could have been. So mm -hmm. I want to put that out, but I, but it's one of my favorite talks. I gave it in Scotland. Um, last time I was in the UK, I did it here in town, but I, I start actually, that off. I actually nearly came to that, but that's when I first opened. I remember. That I, remember. I was gutted, mate. I couldn't get no staff. Yeah. It's all, it's all good. I'll be back. I'll Honestly, be back. You're more than welcome at any of my gyms. Yeah. hundred percent. We can set that up, man. Well, we will. We absolutely sure. will. Okay. We will. Okay, cool. hundred percent. Um, but when I do that talk, the first thing I did, and it was really fun to do, and I could do this, I need to do this again, as I looked at that year's or the previous year's top 10 Mr. Olympias, I did my best to figure out when they turn pro and how long or how long are their first between their first show and when they turn pro. And the average was two and a half years, basically. A, a couple, Sean Roden had a break and one of the other competitors had like a, like a five or six year break where they didn't compete. So I didn't count that. Two and a half years, first show to gaining pro status. That would be the top 10 in Olympia, right? Like that's, you know, nowadays that happens in bikini and some of the other divisions. Um, but, you know, in, in the bodybuilding world, that doesn't happen very, very often. But you saw, that was the average on all those guys. So there's, that's what, that's what you will know if you've got that kind of genetics. It becomes really evident early on. Yeah. You see it just because you outpace your peers. So, yeah, so that's, and, and you know, when it comes, I was going to say, when it comes to doing what I would do, um, what I do is what works for me in the body that I have now, if I had someone else's physique, if I had Brandon's body, you know, and his genetics, I probably would be doing what he's doing or something very similar to it. <clears throat> so, you know, it's, it's not like I'm picking this, you know, I wish I could train like Brandon. I wish I could look like Brandon. It'd be great, but that's not the case. So number six here on the list. So that was kind of two in a way there with variety and specificity, but uh, another big aspect of variety, and this is one speaking of Jordan that I saw him post about not too long ago. It's part of my fortitude training program is variety in rep ranges. Yes. So you can That's do huge. really, yeah, you can do really well just, you know, with heavy, you know, slag iron all the way through, but even in DC training, the widow makers are in there for a reason. That's a higher rep range. Yeah. You can make progress in the 20 to 30 rep range and go with that. If you're progressing and form follows function, you're going to get bigger. You know, those are brutal. That's not, that's called light, but it ain't, it's not easy. Oh, no, 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 no. I've done it before. Yes. Uh, yeah, I was, I'm pretty sure I died for about a couple of uh, minutes after. After a Widowmaker? Yeah. 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 That's kind of the idea, right? You know, that's why yeah, they're I named think, that. I, I think I did an FLF with Jordan on Lake Press, actually. I did actually mm -hmm. beat him. So, 
Yeah. <laughs> Which is a lot. Which is a lot. Yeah. Um, that's, yeah the only thing, that's the only thing I could keep up with Jordan, by the way. Just legs. Every yeah. He smashes me. So I love him. Yeah. He's a monster, man. But there's the, that's, I think, re- really, really important. If you want to, this is about off season progress and maintaining and persisting in that is you'll plateau eventually, you know, in some way, shape, or form. And having that variety in there, I think, is, is really, really important. And know that you can call upon that. And that is, it's a form of periodization. It can be done in the way I do it with fortitude training as a daily undulating periodization. So you train heavier on one days. Uh, you might, on another day, you might do much lighter, but I call these pump sets. And then I've got a cluster set called a muscle round. Yeah. Um, you can do, you know, a standard linear periodization model where you go, you know, heavier and then moderate and then lighter over the course of one month at a time or one mesocycle at a time or what have you. So, but that I think is, is very, very key because you'll run yourself into the ground if you just stick with one, you know, potentially psychologically too, but there's something to say and some evidence is now coming out that you do actually have some fiber type specific differences in what, uh, what's evoked muscle hypertrophy wise with the different rep ranges. There's some older data and some newer stuff. And the thing that, that fits in with this too is as you get stronger with the big heavy weights, then that those lighter weights feel much lighter. And as you get right, right, like you, you know, you're used to sense. absolutely because yeah, whenever you make pros in the top sets that are heavy, automatically the back off set is just flies every single time. Right. So right. Th- th- there is a lot of merit to working across all rep ranges. I absolutely agree. Absolutely. And then if you do, you know, widow makers or high rep sets yep. where you're just like, you know, you everything feels like, you know, you're going to, you're going to melt from the pain. Then when you're at the end of those heavy sets, you know, it's, it's nothing compared to what you went through when you did a set that lasted 60 seconds, you know, you got two or three reps, which really, really diabolical, yeah. but so that, so they, so they interrelate to one another and progress and adaptation in one getting stronger, getting bigger, holding those big heavy weights helps with the lighter loads and, and like grinding through those lighter loads makes, it makes it easier at the end of those heavy sets where you've got to like push for it's literally those last two reps are maybe like seven or eight seconds total, yeah. you know, compared to like a widow maker. If you do train that way, you may have five or six reps. You may have 15, 20 seconds where it's like, Oh shit. And they're all killing you. Dying. <laughs> right. Right. So those interrelate to one another. So that's another, like they feed on one another, especially yeah. someone isn't used to doing those simultaneously, you know, in it's a daily well. periodization. Say it again. It's not all stimulus as well. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. So it, it made the list. Absolutely. Let's see, this. Let's see here. I'm, I'm continuously taking notes. So. <laughs> you know, like, I, I love doing that though. You know, every podcast that I even I do myself or listen to, I always make sure I take notes. It's just a habit of mine. Yeah. That's a good habit, man. That's a one way of learning. Like you, if you speak it, you it know, if you read it. it, if you write it down, with, sing with it, me, teach it. Me, I always sing in better if I listen to it. And then write it down. Yeah. Yeah, that's smart. Yep. So let's see. I'm trying to get through our list here before we go go too long. We got it like four, three or four more. We'll do uh, uh, we'll, we'll do one more, Scott, and then we'll do okay. part two. Okay. So we'll we'll um actually let's do this. I'm gonna kind of jump to the end because the next ones are on diet, supplementation, some other things. Uh the last one I put it, I put it in as kind of an honorable mention. We can consider it kind of the 12th. Hold on, my computer's freezing. Like, there you are, you're back. Is plan ahead so you don't lose what you gain. Oh, so, yeah. And it's kind of a big one because it's sort of a, you can, you can set up a nice off season and then you like you run your off season to where you're like, I barely got 12 weeks to diet down into into shape and you diet so hard that you lose whatever gains you made. And there's two pieces to this, at least one is that you just have to diet too fast and the caloric deficit is too extreme. and You don't hold on to those gains just because of it. Like that's that's neither here nor there. If you try to diet too hard, you're, you're holding muscles going to be difficult. Um, 
So that would go with all the other things that we'll maybe talk about the next go round is, you know, if someone, for instance, part of their gains are leveraged on PED use, then, you know, if you don't have that sort of trump card to help you hold on to muscle the way old school bodies will typically do it. You know, if you're, if you're like Dante's talked about this, you know, HRT, let food be your anabolic in the off season, grow that way. And then if you come into a, a pre-contest period where now you've got, you can grow into your prep if you're adding in those goodies at the end. Yeah. So like having that strategy, planning ahead to see what you're going to do. Whereas you blast full bore, you know, on let's say worst case scenario, you've got all sorts of goodies in there. You maybe toxed out your liver, you know, you really stress yourself with the PED use. And you go right into a diet because you only have 12 weeks to do it and you have to drop your calories in the bucket. You're going to lose a lot of what you gain, if maybe not all of it. Yeah. Your, your diet's too se severe and the PED use isn't there to help support the muscle mass as you die down, dry down, because you've already maxed that out. Yeah. There's nothing left in that tank. Um, and the other aspect is sort of the sciencey thing is that this is just like thing that, you know, people have figured out over the years and it makes sense too is to hold your gains for some period of time. So yeah. if you, yeah, so if you've gone off season for a while, sorry, go ahead, you wanna say something? Oh, mate, I'm just like, every time you mention one of these topics, I'm like, oh my God, yes. Yeah. I think that's definitely like, you, it's, it's as if you're going through a list of mistakes that I used to make as well. Yeah. Which is just yeah. so important. Like, this is why I wanted to cover this with yourself because there's just so much value for this. And yeah yeah uh, you know the maintenance phase i think that's key and generally that maintenance phase would be for me when the supplementation use is brought right back down right in that hold very smart way to do that so if someone's strategizing those things um well, there's supplementation it, use and the volume is brought down and then the hold maintain yes exactly because you can't you don't have the recovery because the supplements have come down and also by that time, let's say you've gone for six months and now your calories are sky high, your GI doesn't have any room to put more food down anyway. So now your goal is just to hold on to that. You, you refresh your sensitivity. So then when you put the pedal to the metal with the PEDs, you've got that to help you hold on to the muscle mass. Um, so like planning ahead for that and having simply enough time. And what that's doing too, probably, especially if someone's really truly gained new muscle mass, is there's it seems like there, there's a period of time where like you're setting up shop with that new muscle mass in terms of what satellite cells are doing. Um, it takes a while for those to get into place. It's, if you look at some of the studies, and this is a whole other tangent, but you can turn on muscle growth and actually get some hypertrophy without satellite cells necessarily being involved. But eventually, as the cells grow and their volume increases, they're going to want to have more satellite cells in the long haul because those each satellite cell has its own uh, sort of volume of the muscle cell, the, the myonuclear domain that it's in charge of. So let's say you, and at C, my, my best guess from like piecing things together is that the cell is growing, the cell is growing more and more protein, and then as needed, more nuclei come into place. So you've got the growth sort of leading the way as the satellite cells make their way in and set up shop to govern that new myonuclear domain. It's like adding post offices to a growing city. So the city gets bigger and let's say you've gotten, I don't know what that like that um, sort of lag is, but let's say it's just 10% and let's just kind of play this numerically. Let's say you put on 10% more muscle mass that you truly have as, as far as muscle, cell muscle, muscle mass is not just volume or glycogen, that's more protein. And that's that lag, lag time between when the satellite cells actually go in to help you hold on to that. Cause they, once they take up residence, they stay 10% is a lot of muscle mass, you know, for someone, you know, that's another, you know, five kilos of muscle mass for yeah. someone potentially 10, 12 pounds of stage weight, giant, that's huge. huge yeah. So if you get that and you got it, and then you start dying down right off the bat and you remove whatever an anabolisms or anabolic stimuli from the food or what have you, um, and start going the opposite direction, you may never get the, those satellite cells may say, Ooh, this is a mistake. We don't need to be here. They never go set up shop. They're not there to help hold on to that size. This is sort of the, this is muscle memory, um, sort of, you know, in terms of holding on to the muscle. But if you, if you literally get those processes in motion and then keep the, keep the muscle mass that you have the way we just talked about, 
by yeah. keeping your food high, um, dropping your volume down, keeping your strength the same, keeping the same. Then you've given some time to where those satellite cells to set up shop. You can do you literally, you got the building materials in place to set up the post offices where they're needed. And now they're in place. That muscle is going to stick better. It's like the, that's the bro. Like it just stays better. If you give yourself a couple months at least to hold it. So there's something to say for that. So you got to think, this is why I set up my be your own bodybuilding coach is kind of a year long plan is you got to kind of think ahead. So, you know, am I going to like do a nine month off season and have no, no time to hold on and just go right into my diet? Or do I want to do, you know, six months and do a three month period where I take care of my liver health. I get myself ready for the rigors of prep and hold that size that I've gained, hopefully in the previous half year. So that's the don't of that's the kind of the one don't of the list is like, don't not plan ahead. So make sure you plan with these things in mind. If you want to keep the size, because otherwise literally uh, Scott actually did a story. Um, I'm blanking on his name right now um, with a high level. He may have gotten his pro card. Even though he's a high level national level guy in the U S yeah. who uh, name almost hit me. He went up to over 300 pounds. You probably heard the podcast. Wow. The, you know, he's like, he got gigantic. And then he dieted and dieted. I don't know if he did this or not, but he was an example of someone. He came down, he has ended up like 220, something like that. Um, so yeah, right. So he lost like a massive amount of weight, which tells me something was awry. Wow. You know, like a lot of that was probably water, what have you, but he dieted so hard. Wow. If, if he had held on to that, let's say he, he, he got to 300, and maybe he came down to 280, something that was more reasonable. He stayed there for three or four years and then dieted down. I'd be willing to bet money he would have been able to step on stage with more body weight. 240. Yeah, for instance, right, which is that's a whole other weight class, oh. the whole other ball game. It's, it's another physique, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So that's a common thing you see is, you know, it's not, it's not that that like kind of mega bulking strategy might not be what you need to do. Um, you know, you, obviously body fat is not your goal. Problem is, Scott, problem is, Scott, people don't like to have time off. Yeah. Like yep. I always say this, people, right, right. Mm. anyone can, anyone can find it easy to be disciplined in prep, right? Yeah. We can all agree because yeah. everything gets so structured and rigid. Yeah. The difference, the, between, pressure. Between, the difference between someone that's a decent bodybuilder and a great bodybuilder, a great bodybuilder is able to do that year round. Yeah. And I think yep. that is where the key, that is where the magic happens. Like mm -hmm. ever since I've been able to keep the discipline of prep, throughout my off season, that's when I've been making the most progress. And like, it truly, I've truly been able to do that this past off season. And that is where I've made my most progress using the less, least supplementation as well. Right. And I feel yeah. like I can probably- That's in the list that. down here too. So yeah. It's yeah, 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 yeah. And I feel like I can repeat that again, just through keeping that, you know, that rigid structure and discipline. But this time around, I'm planning on having a little bit longer off which will be even better. Yeah, it, it really, it pans out for so many, so many guys. Yeah. Um, Ken Hill, you probably, you know, if you've paid attention to Skip. Yes. From, uh, yeah, yeah, I listened to Skip Hill quite, quite, quite a little bit as well, yeah. And he had this glute issue that he talked about last year, yeah. but he, when he was dieting down, he had, he had, um, his hematic was really high. I can't, I'm not, I'm, the details might be a little mixed up, but his hematic was really high. He was living in Colorado. He came off. He was just HRT for a long time. Um, like the, maybe it was a the theme of his of his uh, articles that he writes for Elite FDS, his column there. And um, and then he decided he's going to go for it. And he looked phenomenal before he had this glute issue that took him out. And he he was gain like he looked better than he ever has at basically at fifty. Yeah. yeah. And, and but he had a long a prolonged break. Yeah. which basically gave him kind of a, a re, like newbie gains for an advanced guy. Yeah. So there's a lot to say for that. Yeah. So I think many people, like I said, the, 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 that's a great thing that you've mentioned, planning ahead. It's the way I've mapped out my, my next off season, right, Scott, is mm -hmm. I'm going to need a minimum of 12 months off, a minimum, because yep. it takes roughly eight to 10 weeks post-show just to recover. Yeah. That's before right. I even start growing. Right, right. That two, that's two months gone already. And yeah. for me to make substantial amount of progress and gain that muscle mass, mm -hmm. after them two months, I'm going to need an off-season. Six, 
seven months until I know to hold. Yeah. So that's nine months done already, isn't it? Yeah. Once I've done the nine months, I'm going to have to hold for a month or two. Yeah. Right. That's almost a year gone. Right. So, you know, when people say, yeah, I'm going to do a huge off season now. And they're like, yeah, I'm going to do six months off. I'm like, you know, <laughs> that's, that's nothing. You, you know, if you're yeah. the right way and actually hold on to some decent muscle tissue yeah, and not, you know, not, not do it in a way that's going to create health issues as well. Mm-hmm. I doubt that's going to be possible. When you're starting off, that's the thing. Like every year has is different. You know, the first year is different. The second, the law of diminishing okay. returns applies. Yeah. So, and and also, social media is coloring what we think, what we see as possible. You're seeing genetic responders that are, and and you're you're obviously genetically elite. And listen, you're you know you have to do this. Yeah. You know, not that you don't train hard, but you know, there's there are lots of people you probably run into or or train like animals but they're not nearly as good as you. So you've got at least average genetics, you know, like I would say, you know, probably above average, I'm guessing. Um, but what you did in the first year or the third year or the fifth year isn't what, you, what you're going to be doing in your 10th year, you know, if you want to make progress. To be honest, it's the, it's the application that's changed a lot. The application was terrible in the early years. So yeah, it's like, I truly think that I, I can really, really tap into the most progress just recent, really, you know? Yeah just with learning more about myself and how to approach things from mental aspect, like mm-hmm. I explained to you earlier with the training side of things, being able right. to still progress and not dig myself a hole. Cause I kid you not, Scott, I, I, I have wasted a long time just spinning wheels and just being beat up constantly through just being yeah. too, too, uh, too wild. I would say. Yeah. Well, it worked for you. Yeah. You know, yeah. It worked. Things. It worked, it worked for sure, but it's you know it could have been a million times better. Right. Yeah. 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 And and then that's that's the thing that you know kudos to you for doing that because you know it's so often like if you something worked and worked really well like that has a really strong impression. Yeah. You know, and you made your like everyone you make your best games when you're first starting out, and you could do that and get away with it. Mm-hmm. And a lot of times, and this is what I you know like when I try to. Um, with my coaching, the way I do it a lot of times is people come to me when they tried everything and they, they thought it through as much as they can. And then maybe I can give them a new perspective, which is an honor to do. But I like, cause, cause then they're really ready to take that information if they finally come to me. So it, I can really help people, I think substantially, and I'm not trying to toot my own horn, but like when they're ready and right for the, some new answers and they're willing to take on new information because they kind of like, I don't know what else I've tried everything I can. And, but some people never get to that place. They just, they keep on doing what works so well, because that's your, that's your best first impression, you know, and you kudos to you for like stepping outside of your, of your own box, your own ego and saying, you know, I'm no, I just watched your training videos, you know, like, like people are like, and not that you're going to like all of a sudden start doing, I'm going to almost said the word, like, you know, counting your reps in reserve or whatever. Right. But but you're known for training that way and you like to do that. And it's how you sort of set yourself up. So that's what you want to do, uh, you know, and that, but that hasn't worked. It's not working for you to beat yourself in the ground like that consistently. Yeah. Um, at some point in time, you kind of have to uh, realize, I realized this many, many moons ago, I still have trouble applying it. To be perfectly honest is that my mind is much stronger than my body. Absolutely. You know, yeah. you know? And it's like, okay, I got this. Like, I don't need to continue proving to myself. You know, that I'm indomitable, you know, oh, I got stop. it, you know. Honestly, I, I used to go and go until I would be physically poorly, physically sick. Yeah. And then I would be forced to start the gym through illness. Mm-hmm. I'd just get over the illness one a day or two days and I'd be right. straight back in. And, you know, yeah. it was yep. just a vicious circle that, that used to go around in. But for me, it, it's just always want to progress more. If, mm-hmm. I, see, if I see good progression... I'll sit down, I'll break it down. I'll be like, what can I do to get even more? Yeah. I think that's kind of the beauty of bodybuilding for me. I think there's a, you go ahead. can always squeeze more out of it. Oh yeah. There's always something to learn. Absolutely. You know? This is, you know what, this is why I love it so much because it's like, even like small little things, I feel like you can learn from almost every single person with what they do and what they say. And, that, mm-hmm. and that's, I think that's something that's just amazing. 
Yeah. And then listening, sometimes you can get the most, the wisest insights from people who are relatively naive, you know, who aren't so caught up in everything. If you're just paying attention, um, you know, you, you pick, I love, there's this one of my favorite scenes because it applies to like, like how you can behave in the gym. And it popped in my mind now thinking about like learning to be patient and not like continue to try to like, you know, push things, driving yourself into the ground and getting nowhere. It's from, um, I can't remember which Star Wars. I think it may be Return of the Sith. And there's two, the two Jedi, Liam Neeson and um, is it Colin uh, McGregor? Colin, Colin McGregor, I yeah. think. Yeah. They're the two Jedis. And uh, they're battling one of these Siths on a, on a ship. And there, it's like two on one, but the Sith's badass. And he's like, he's maybe going to get the he's best smoking, of them. He's smoking them both. Yeah, like it's, it's getting, and, and so uh, I think it's Colin McGregor, or um, Liam Neeson's character. They get separated. One of the, like, somehow he, like, he gets he, the, um, Colin McGregor's like the young uh, Obi-Wan Kenobi, I think. Yeah, yeah. He's, he's not as experienced. He's up and coming in. He's up and coming. Yeah, and he's going to get his ass whipped by the Sith. And he's on the, he gets on the other side of this wall on the ship. There's no way to get around to help him. And literally, if he, if he doesn't get there in the next 15, 20 seconds, you can see that's going to be it. His head's coming off. And the door closes, and Liam Neeson's character has no choice. There's nothing he can do. He has to wait for that door to open in some way, shape, or form. And I think he knows it's going to open. I can't remember the exact details. So he, he goes from all out, like, lightsabers twirling around, like, you know, just craziness. And he know, just, you, you know the scene? And he just stops, and he goes into a meditative state. There's nothing else to do. Yeah. That's the most logical. That's the best course of action. And then the doors open. Boom. He flies through them right. and he goes right to town again. And that's kind of, you have to have that ability in the gym to turn it on and off when you ought to regulate yourself in so many ways over the long-term planning that you're doing, like we talked about too, how you do your training, like not driving, like literally that there's, there's a certain power of strength of mind that comes with being able to push yourself way beyond what your body can handle you prove that to yourself time and time again now there's a next level of being sort of um wise and recognizing that there is ultimate power up here and being able to to direct that you're not just like going in with your samurai sword and just chopping everything up you're being very precise there's a, there's a time and a place yes i think there's a time and a place and i think timing of that is absolute key Mm-hmm. Yeah, to be able to truly, truly like squeeze every ounce of it, I think. Yeah. There's an old there's an old joke about the young and the uh, the the new bull, the young bull and the old bull. Yeah. And um they're sitting on top of the hill. You may have heard this before, they're sitting on top of the hill yeah. and uh the, the young bulls, and there's a bunch of heifers down there, and he's like, They're the, the young bulls like, man, like look at those. Like, I why don't we just run down there and just like just jump on one of them and just like bang the heck out of them. Yeah. And the old bull's like, yeah, we could do that. We could just saunter down there and we could have our pick of all of them as long as we wanted to. Yes. yes. <laughs> so you just take your time, be careful, you know, wind your way through. And that's where you can really get the real true rewards. As long as you're able to be a little bit wise about it, like the old bull. Yeah. Yeah. So I don't know if that's the best place to end, but oh, it been, it's, there's something it's to say for that. Too. Oh, unbelievable. So um, this is, wrap up of our part one beautifully wrapped up by scott cool. <laughs> uh, that was absolutely amazing Be the scott, old bull scott that was uh, an unbelievable conversation and i cannot wait for part two um Likewise. i think the, the listeners are, are going to love this uh before we go before we wrap up uh share those plugs uh please please plug yourself as much as possible um you are still actively coaching yep yeah, yeah, I, I still just, I say, this is, I was got the book out here. Yeah. This is what I suggest to a lot of people first. Literally, people come to me and they say, "Hey, you're coaching," and they don't know how I kind of coach. Yeah. If this book, it's people they scoff at the price sometimes, but it's like a brain dump. You have it, you know this, and Amazing. most of the questions that people would come with me from the things they can get there. Um, so, it's it's very very much how I run my peak weeks for myself. Yeah. Yeah, I'm glad to hear that. We've got a we've got a, a published article now that came out in the scientific literature. Seen it. Yeah. That's yeah. That's basically the same same thing, but we just you know, um, with some big names: Brad Schoenfeld, Alan Aragon, Guillermo Escalante, right. Chris Barricat, myself. Amazing. Um, 
but yeah, I still, I'm still coaching. What I do is phone consults with people yeah. basically and on ad hoc as needed basis. Yeah. So that could be every week, every other day, couple of days, like if someone needs that, yeah. but the standard kind of coaching model where, and you know, this, like you check in, it's like, okay, you know, let's, let's take 50 carbs out of this, you know, meal or like, let's, eventually you know what's going on let's just go off and go scott probably doesn't do that if there's something that you need to dig into i think yeah yeah i i've done that for years and there's something to that but like just from a practical standpoint most people if they're paying attention and they're wanting to learn they know what i'm going to do like it's like you like they know the answer before we get there some people you know if they have hurdles they're coming to so i try to it's not that i like i see myself as like this you know guru floating around a lotus position or whatever like you know but like it, it's not oh. that it's like where can i where can i like kind of fit in to help the most people that i can and people like to listen with podcasts i think i can help people in that regard because literally like talk about law of diminishing returns after you've done like you know three or four weeks of check-ins like wh why should someone be paying for you to just like tell them to like you know you know don't don't eat the you know the second cup of rice in that meal or whatever that doesn't, but there, there are people that, that want coaching with that style. And there's lots of phenomenal coaches who do that. It's just not my, yeah. Or they're like, yeah, totally. Absolutely. And there's, you know, everyone's got their own thing, but my best place to help sort of, you know, long, along the spectrum of people is the way that I'm doing it. So I'm just trying to do Absolutely. my, in my role. Absolutely. I think Scott is definitely a, a different level as an educator as um the yoda the yoda of bodybuilding i would say yeah you like that's that neil one, hill yeah, that's like his, that that's that's neil yeah i don't yeah. like the guru listen, thing it's listen, a four letter word it, it's not neil come on mate neil doesn't uh, look like yoda you, you suit the yoda more much more for me i look more like yoda yeah. Yeah. i do a good yoda impersonation maybe for the next that's one what i mean neil can't do that mate so come on let, okay let, so there you go yeah. i'll take it yeah. i'll take it uh yeah, definitely, guys. Look, if you want to reach out to Scott, I will put down the links below. I'll uh, I'll put down the link to his book as well. So I, I am going to get Scott to shoot me over all the information, and you will get to get to have it handy. Um, Scott, really appreciate you. Absolutely love this conversation, and I can't wait for part two. It will be amazing. Um, yes. Thank you for now, guys. Take care and peace. And if there's any questions, anything you want to ask Scott before the next part, please comment below. Scott will be more than happy to go for the questions or anything like that. Um, so, yes, I appreciate this, guys. Thank you. Take care and peace.